All right. Well, that means that we're going to get started. It's uh, I'm sure just a little bit right right now it's seven o'clock. Boy, talk about starting on time. So let's begin as always by praying together. Father, what a joy it is to be here tonight. Thank you so much for providing us with the freedom to gather both in person and online, just to have the opportunity to, to gather together as your people, studying your word. Father, we pray that you fill our hearts with truth tonight as we dig into um, the 13th and 14th chapter of Acts. We know, Father, that in the heart of it is your heart for us, your desire to help us to understand how you act and react among human beings on this earth. And I just continue to be so grateful to uh, have the opportunity to know Jesus, to see how he lived, to know how you, Father, lived in the flesh as a human being. So, Father, thank you for doing that for us and for living that uh, perfect life. Uh, and then, Father, being willing to go to the cross on our behalf. Thank you for the amazing grace and mercy that you show us through Christ. May you continually help us with your Holy Spirit as you have and as you, uh, as you are to, to understand your will for us. Lead us, Father, counsel us, um, rebuke us where we need to be rebuked. Help us, Father, in this world to live lives that always point to you and glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to go through chapter 13 and 14 of Acts. As we have in the past, we'll be reading some of the passages, and then I'll be talking about some. I wanted to uh, do something maybe not totally different, but in each of the sections tonight, I want to make sure that we discuss more specifically some of the applications that we can pull away from the text. Uh, I know I've said this before, but I continue to say it um, you know, our, our goal is not just to get information, though that's good, and to learn more about the word. Uh, I always believe that through the spirit, our goal is to receive transformation of what God wants to do through the power of his word. So though we read about things that are happening in the first century, um, those truths are still in, in very specific ways, I think very meaningful ways still applicable to us today. And so I wanna make sure that we're constantly drawing on some of those applications. Certainly the ones that I uh, will mention aren't the only ones that are there and you may find others. I just want us to, to hit in on a couple of them as we continue to do this. So let me get Kimberly. Kimberly, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. Good, good to have you with us. Good to be here. I didn't even realize last week it was Tuesday until like nine o'clock. And I was like, oh, I missed class. <laughs> I was so were mad you, at myself. Were you able to see it online? You know, you can watch them online later. Oh, I did not realize that. I'll have to go and check that out. Yeah, if you if you still have the email way back early on as the class starts, I gave you a link to do that. But um, okay. if you don't, just send me a quick email and I'll send you the link again where you can get on YouTube. You Thank you. I, sh I should still have the email, but if not, I will definitely reach out and send you and a message. If you get on the SHBI YouTube page, we'll have a place for you to find it there. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Well, let's just read the first three verses. Acts chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So just a couple things real quick. This is Antioch in Syria, still not uh, Pisidian Antioch. Remember there are, maybe remember isn't good. Know that there are several Antiochs. We're going to talk about another Antioch soon that's actually in Pisidia or in Asia Minor. This is down in Syria, still north of where Palestine would be. And so um, just a thing to know, and maybe you already know this, when when we read about the church and we see Paul and Barnabas going into these cities, you're always going to hear about the church in Antioch, 
the church in Iconium, the church in Derby. You never really hear about the churches that are there. We will read about synagogues, plural, in Cyprus, where Paul and Barnabas are going to go. But as um, scripture is being written, as the early disciples saw the church, remember that they didn't see it as a building. Synagogues were really building meeting places for Jews to study. But they saw the church as all those who believed in Jesus. So that doesn't mean that there weren't different groups meeting within the city. Their perception, though, was all believers in all meeting places. It was just the church. And I just think that's still important for us to understand that though there are several churches in League City or Clear Lake or Houston or whatever it might be, I still think it's important that we understand that that believers in Jesus, you know, they, they are the body, the one body of Christ. We are the one church. And so we should always see ourselves in that light. Uh, it says that there were prophets and teachers, and it names Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menean, and Saul. We don't really differentiate, differentiate which or which. Though Saul and Barnabas are later called apostles, um, Saul seems like, from what I hear and read about Saul in scripture, or Paul, was likely more a teacher than he was a prophet. Seems like he grew up uh, in the Jewish tradition, a very learned man in the scriptures. And so, um, as we saw last week, uh, when Barnabas went to a city and there became Gentile converts, he called Paul, remember, into the city so that he could teach them further about who the Lord was. So it's not really important that we differentiate uh, one from the other, but we just know that in Antioch, the very uh, central important city, I think, in the spread of the gospel outside of Jerusalem, there was already gathered people who were prophets and teachers for Jesus. So uh, Simeon perhaps is a prophet uh, in Jerusalem at Jesus's circumcision when Joseph and Mary bring Jesus to be circumcised on the eighth day. Um, in Luke chapter two, he mentions Simeon who is there and prophesies about Jesus, about the child. So perhaps this is the same man who's gone from Jerusalem into Antioch after the persecution. We don't know for sure. Um, it's probably a more common name. And so just like many people in our cultures have the same names, um, historically for scripture, that doesn't always differentiate or connect people. Uh, so we could, we could connect that. Maybe he was that prophet. Uh, Lucius is mentioned in Romans 16, 21, or A. Lucius is mentioned by Paul at the end of Romans as he sort of lists these people that send Rome their greetings. And he mentions Lucius as one of his relatives in Romans 16, 21, possibly the same one as well. Uh, Mannion is not ever mentioned again, <clears throat> but I really want us to see here the church's activities. I don't know if you caught it. They were, they were together worshiping, it says, the Lord and fasting. And so we see this picture of them being together, serving God, fasting together. And in that atmosphere, it's when it says the Holy Spirit told them to set apart Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas for the work that he had in mind for them. What I really find interesting is after that's done, it says after that, they prayed and fasted some more. And so I, th I think that's still such an important activity for us as churches, because <laughs> worshiping, praying, fasting is just our way to really get ourselves connected, right, in tune with God through the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean when it said the Holy Spirit said, set apart? Um, was it an audible voice? Maybe it was, but as they're praying and fasting and there's prophets there, however it was revealed, it was clear to them that the Spirit was asking them to set apart Paul and Barnabas. So they again pray and fast, probably not uh, as some way to decide whether they're set apart, but rather to send them on their way, to commission them, to support them as they're sent out with the Holy Spirit. And then they lay their hands on them and they're sent off. Another picture of what happens uh, in the First Testament church is that they're, they're connecting one another with prayer and fasting and with laying on the hands is sort of the sign of, of God's choice of commissioning. Um, and so we'd still 
practice that. I don't know if you do in your congregation. It's not, you know, it doesn't make you uh, a yes or a no with Jesus. But I think that practice still uh, is important, not only to the person that's being commissioned, but I think to the church as a whole, as leaderships uh, set apart people for ministries or commission people to ministries, to to pray and to fast, to anoint with oil, to lay hands on them. I just think that's a great picture, a great reminder. I think I've said this before, but if I haven't, I love how many things God uses that are physical things that help us remember spiritual realities. So the Lord's Supper is one of those. We take the bread and the wine in remembrance of Jesus. It's a physical thing that really helps us get in touch, recall what Jesus did. Baptism for me certainly is one of those things where we participate in the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. And it's a time when uh, most of us at least uh, come to that initial faith in Jesus because we see an axe and they're baptized. And I think I said this before, I don't remember the exact day and time that I came to faith, but I can remember my baptism. I remember where I was and who, you know, who was there and being baptized. And uh, I just constantly recalls back to that. And Paul even uses that, like in Romans, he says, don't you remember that you were baptized? Um, he could have said, don't you remember that you had faith in Jesus? Um, but he uses baptism because I think God uses those things to help us. And so laying on the hands, anointing with oil, all of those things have great spiritual significance. But it seems to me that God chooses those things because they have great significance to us as well, because it helps us remember something important that's going on. All right, let's go on to chapter uh, 13, 4 through 12. So from here on out, we're going to basically read in sections um, that describe them going to a certain city and the, the things that are recorded happening there. So this uh, is where Paul goes to another Antioch. Uh, I'm sorry, it goes on to Cyprus. I'm ahead of myself. So verses four through 12. The two of them, Barnabas and Saul, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. This is a John Mark that we met just earlier. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Papos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bargesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Alemus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means. So Bar Jesus is also named Alemus, but Alemus is a word that means the sorcerer. Okay. So um, same guy. He opposed them and turned the proconsul from the faith. And I'm sorry, he opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Alemus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So, as you've heard me stumble from time to time early on in Acts, I'm often calling Saul Paul. This is the official time when Acts, at least Luke, begins never to call Paul Saul again. In verse 9, it says he was also known as Paul. I don't know if there's a significance there, but at least... In my mind, I see Saul early on still being connected in his Jewish roots. He receives a, the call from Jesus to be the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. And from here on out, though he does still continue to connect with Jews, his main mission is going to be among Gentile um, cities. And uh, I guess I should have looked at this. There's a possibility that Saul is more Jewish and Paul is more Gentile, Greek in meaning it's not unusual for people to have 
you know, if they're Jewish, to also have a Greek name as well. well and so, it's important to know what you think that Saul knew what he did as uh, Pharisee to Pharisees to go on uh, Christian to Christians. Mm -hmm. Kind of had to have to go, go through a metamorphosis. Yeah. Well, and I think at least in the mind of the Jews, maybe they were glad to call him something besides the Saul that they knew. Yeah. That's not the Saul we know. Now there's just Paul that we're not so happy with, maybe. But yeah, um, you're right. I think he definitely went through this great change. So having him, you know, change his name as well, you know, seems like it could be pretty easy. So this is the beginning of Saul's what what most people refer to as his first missionary journey. So they're sent off, they go to the island of Cyprus. As your map shows, um, it will show his movement. The, the key is there on the bottom left to help you sort of understand how he moves. And you'll notice that in the dark blue, the first journey, you'll kind of see how he goes. It's a pretty tight little circle at first. And so we'll find out way at the end that when he completes the circle and goes back to Antioch in Syria, it says that he completed the mission that he was called to do. So though we don't read about it, it seems that the Holy Spirit had given them their marching orders in some way, either ahead of time saying, here's the places you're going to go. We don't know that. Or when they completed this journey and, and they were headed back to Antioch, the spirit must have led them in some way to know you've completed what I ask you to do through the, this first calling at Antioch. So Saul and Barnabas, <clears throat> now Paul traveled to the island of Cyprus. And he begins to proclaim the word of God in the Jewish synagogues, plural. So this is where he's in Cyprus, and we're seeing that the synagogues are plural, though the church uh, is singular. He experiences this, he has this experience with the Jewish sorcerer named Bar-Jesus, which means son of Jesus. You'll see Bar somebody, that uh, just simply means Bar, uh, the son of. And Jesus was a typical popular name just like it is today. Uh, maybe not as popular among um, Anglo-Saxon people. We tend to get our, our names from Germany and Europe and those places, but certainly among our Hispanic community, Jesus is a very common name uh, uh, among Hispanic people. I can remember we had a man named Jesus who did some um, counter work for us when I was working with the guy that we were remodeling houses and uh, my wife first picked up the phone and I had Jesus down on my telephone. She goes, you have Jesus's telephone number? Said, yeah, in more ways than you know. So anyway, he was also uh, Elemus Saucer. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but anyway, I'm doing the best I can. He was, uh, there was an attendant of the Roman, he was an attendant of the Roman pro -council Sergius Paulus, and there are at least two or three um, extra biblical inscriptions that name in the mid first century around the 50s, 40s uh, AD, a man named Sergius Paulus. And interestingly enough, a couple of them give his first name. Romans often had three different names like we do, like mine's Mark, Todd, Walton, Ba. Theirs had three different names, like their first name, their family name, and then I forget what the other name was. Uh, but anyway, his his first name was Lucius, not the Lucius that we read about early on. Uh, but there are, uh, you know, other inscriptions that that uh, tell us about Sergius Paulus, which I think for me is uh, one of the important things that helped me understand that scripture has a reality to it. So they're not just talking about, um, you know, things that were happening among the Jewish community, but they're, they mention a lot of places and names and rulers that have all been backed up in archaeology and through other ways that show us that it's true. Um, and certainly for them to write and to have these letters circulating around like they did, if there were false names, false ideas, false uh, statements made, it would have been so easy for people to prove at that time that they weren't. And yet nobody does. You never hear anything about, you know, people talking about these writings being false. And they mention this person and that's not true. And they doing this and that's not true. So that's another, uh, to me, an indicator of the truth of scripture. 
And so I just love all those things. I'm, I'm kind of a, I was hated his history in school, but I'm kind of a history nut now. I love history and how it all connects. So it says he's an intelligent man who wanted to hear the God, wanted to hear the word of God. Not, an, not necessarily an unusual thing. We're going to read later on in Acts uh, 17, how Paul goes uh, into Athens and he, he goes to the Areopagus where it says Greeks gathered to hear the latest news. So they were, it seemed to indicate that in their time, Greeks loved getting the latest story, the latest news. They were constantly talking about different things that were happening. And so uh, it, it was just sort of a um, reality of their time. And many people today are that way. You know, I, uh, maybe you do, you know, like to hear all the latest things that are happening and what's going on and stay in touch. Certainly news uh, can be, you know, an indicator of that. So Paul confronts this Jewish sorcerer. Uh, and what I want us to see is that he is, you know, very bold with him. He doesn't mince any words. And he immediately tells him who he's representing. Though he's a Jew, uh, he as a sorcerer, he said, you know, you're, you're causing all this problem because, you know, you're representing the devil. You know, you're representing uh, somebody besides God. And so he does, at least at this point, uh, through the power of the Lord, tell him that because of that, he was going to be blind for some time. And though he was trying to uh, influence Sergius Paulus away from the faith, it's a, this very interaction and what happens to him by Paul indicating he was going to be blind for a time. And then that happening immediately that, uh, you know, Sergius Paulus sees that and trusts, he said, in the word of the Lord, which is interesting, right? Because he uh, indicates Paul's words and what he's saying, representing God as God's word as he does this uh, sort of brings about this miraculous thing in the life uh, of Bar Jesus. So a couple of lessons that I think uh, I wanted us to think about is how important it is for us to discern uh, and also to identify the source of spiritual teaching or spiritual realities. Uh, the more that we uh, come to know God, the more that we understand the will of God through scripture and through, uh, you know, our experiences in, in the truth of scripture, the more uh, we should be able to discern the difference between what is from the spirit of God and what is from some other spirit. And so I think that we can find ourselves in a, in culture where, you know, we may constantly be barred. Like you can't, you can't offend people and you can't, you know, so many truths, your truth is your truth, but my truth is my truth. And it seems to me like it, we are sort of fading back from being bold about, just sort of calling the ace of spades an ace of spades sometimes. First Corinthians chapter five, Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he talks about some sexual sin that's taking place in the church in first Corinthians five. And we won't read it here tonight, but I'd encourage, I'd encourage you to do that. Because one of the things I hear quite often in the church is, you know, we're not supposed to judge. Have you ever, have you ever heard that? Well, you shouldn't say that because, you know, you're not supposed to judge. So on the one hand, that is true. Scripture tells us we shouldn't judge lest we be judged. But in those cases, the idea is us standing in the place of God and making decisions that only God is really allowed to make. I am not in any position to judge whether or not you, you guys online or you guys sitting here are right with Jesus. I can't see your heart. I don't know your heart. Um, even if I if I see you do something that I consider to be um, in opposition to God's will for you, it's not my place to stand in God's place and judge you. And yet at the same time, and according to 1 Corinthians 5, because we're believers, we should be able to um, judge the actions of one another and confront one another when we see things that are happening that are apart from the will of God. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul makes this interesting statement that you should have taken this man and handed him over to Satan. 
have you ever read that passage before? Uh, which is sort of challenging, like, man, that doesn't sound right. You know, we, we shouldn't take church members and hand them over to Satan. That doesn't seem right. But in the context, it says, so that um, his soul might be saved on the day of the Lord. And the indication there, uh, what you should read in that is, Paul said you should have identified his actions with Satan, not with the church. You shouldn't allow that to go on in the church as though this is God's will. Instead, you should say, these are the actions of someone who opposes God. These are the actions of the enemy of God. And to, uh, to hand somebody over and to identify them, hopefully is the means by which that person says, wow, you know, I, okay, I get it. I, I thought I was doing the God thing, but I realize now I'm doing the Satan thing and, you know, it will cause them to repent and turn back. So at the very end of it, Paul will say, who are we to judge those outside of the church? But he says, aren't we to judge those in the church? So in some sense, we are to judge things that are happening within the church. Scripture tells us, uh, maybe you've heard this proverb, you know, that one bad apple spoils the whole bunch, that sin can be like leaven, that just a little leaven works its way through the whole bunch. So as a church, we should always be helping one another, uh, making sure that we're not getting ourselves in a place, you know, where sin is ruling our life. And, and I think it's okay uh, by the example of scripture for us to confront one another once in a while and say are you sure that's from god because that doesn't seem like it's the will of god this seems like it's the will of the enemy so i think we should be able to do that in a loving kind of way not not in a judgmental harsh kind of way but i've said this to my congregation if you see me involved in something that you think is damaging me as a spiritual follower of jesus i want you to tell me because maybe maybe i'm just ignorant and not paying attention maybe i'm a david that's looking at bathsheba and not recognizing what i'm doing you know how deep i'm getting in until the prophet comes and says you're the man right so i want that to happen i need that to happen so the other thing i want us to see is that uh, the miracles here are constantly accredited to the lord and not to humans um, <clears throat> when paul talks about um or Jesus going blind, did you hear what he said? The Lord's hand is against you. He didn't say, oh, because I recognize I'm going to cause you to go blind. You never hear that from the apostles or from people that are doing miracles. They're always giving credit to God. So we're going to read later in our text tonight where this happens again. Do you remember someone who uh, they called God and he didn't he didn't say anything about that earlier on in our studies. Remember Herod, who, um, you know, stands up and gives this speech and everybody's saying, oh, this is God. And we're hearing the very voice of God. And he didn't deny that. And uh, in that case, God struck him down and he died because of it. So um, you see that contrast between people who don't give credit to God and all the people who are the people the apostles and the people doing the miracles consistently and constantly giving credit to God. Mark. And, yes. I think there's one more theme that, uh, that I just recently discovered. Maybe some other people already have, but I've studied it for a long time and somehow missed this. This is the first time of several times that there will be a conf confrontation in the book of Acts with pagan magic. And uh, I think sometimes we don't realize the fact that pagan magic was not only Gentile, but it was Jewish. Right. And so what you have at Colossae and you have at Ephesus, and you also have a mention of it in Galatia, in the Galatian churches, which is what, the, which is what you see in the first missionary journey, that, that what, magic was very, very widespread and widely used as a business. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it just penetrates the, 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 the culture, the Greco-Roman culture, society. Um, it, this is the first time. There'll be some more. Just yeah. a comment. Just a comment. 
Yeah, and I think, um, I, I forget what the name of it is, but there is a mix of Catholicism and magic among the Hispanics in Mexico, especially, that's very dangerous. Um, so it has some elements of Catholicism, but really its heart is in mysticism and magic. Um, I, sorry, I wish I could think of it offhand, but um, yeah, very dangerous. When we try to mix the two, they have nothing to do with each other. The spirit of God and the spirit of magic or Satan have nothing to do with each other. All right, let's go on to verses 13 through 52, longer section. Uh, this is where they go to the Antioch in Pisidia. So this is not the Antioch in Syria. They're headed to a different one. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them and returned to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With their mighty power, he led them out of that country. He endured their conduct for about 40 years in the desert. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus. He has promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, who do you think I am? I am not that one, no, but he is coming after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, children of Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that were read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who, uh, by seen by those who had traveled with him from the Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children by raising up Jesus, as is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I become your father. The fact that God raised him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it's stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy ones see decay. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his fathers and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets had said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, 
we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they expelled them from the region. So they shook the dust from their feet and protested against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So several things uh, I think worthy of pointing out here, um, you know, see Paul and Barnabas again go to the synagogue first, which, uh, which early on is exactly what they did. They consistently went to the Jews first. So the synagogue is a place of gathering where the Jews would come to, uh, to worship, to pray, to mostly study the word. And so to be invited to speak, they had to recognize them as having the ability. I'm guessing they knew Saul, at least from their experience, and knew that he was a Pharisee, that he had been a teacher uh, for some time. And so giving uh, in the synagogue the right to speak was an honor for them. And so uh, he gets up and speaks, and he gives a sort of cleft note version, right, the whole history of mankind. Uh, and, and I want you to see how he, he connects both Jews and Gentiles who are believers he really connects them together as humankind. I don't know if you heard this, but he says, our fathers, our forefathers. And so uh, I think in a sense, he, he's trying to tear down the barriers and help people to recognize God has been at work among all of us, certainly, especially with the Israelites, with the law and the prophets uh, guiding them specifically. But he even says of the Gentiles, he was at work with you as well and providing you with with rain and crops and those kind of things. Um, so anyway, he, he connects them all. He didn't give them a sort of history. Uh, did you catch early on that in the synagogue, they were reading the law and the prophets, right? It's what they did it's, and they knew the scriptures. And so as Paul makes this statement, they're connecting all these things. And then he starts to quote the law and the prophets about all the things that were said, foretold about Jesus happening, connecting Jesus with that. And he, and he does it in such a way that initially, at least, it really draws their attention. At the end of that first Sabbath, you know, they're, they're all excited and they want to invite him back the next Sabbath because they want to hear more. And, and some people follow him. And, and I think during that time, it says he, he encourages them to continue on in the grace of God. He's probably still talking to them about Jesus and giving them more information. And then the next Sabbath happens and, and you, you have to see this. It's a warning sign for us, I think. They come back and it says nearly the whole city gathered. And I, and I don't know how that looked. Synagogues were usually not very big. So I'm guessing this gathering had to take place in another place where there was opportunity for all these people to gather. I don't know how many that would have been, but to say nearly the whole city gathered. Imagine the talk of the town as they're there and they're going around and they're talking and discussing and the Jews are, are wanting to hear more. And unfortunately, what happens is the Jews, it seems, feel like we're losing control here. We're losing our place. And they start to oppose Paul, and it says his message. And so they react uh, very poorly. And Paul's reaction is to speak to them boldly. Hey, if you want to reject this, then understand this is our time to, to go to the Gentiles because you've made your choice uh, he even says, not considering themselves worthy of eternal life. He talks in smack. Oh, man, he's, he's so bold to him. Is it, can, I mean, can you imagine uh, among all these Jews that are there, they're opposing him, and he, and he just doesn't hold anything back. Um, not very politically correct, <laughs> I would say, at this point. Um, and so they turned the attention to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles' reaction is, wow, that's awesome. You know, we feel they felt some privilege now to be considered worthy of what God was doing. They, they knew about the Jewish religion. They knew who God was. Many of them, like Cornelius and some here, were believing already in God through the Jewish community, probably proselytized into being a part of the Jewish community. And now hearing that God was going beyond the borders of Israel for them, 
was something very exciting. And so the Jews, it says, incite people of standing. So important women and men of standing there, they incite them against Paul to try to get them to kick him out of the city. Um, it's in James that James has a rebuke for the church to be careful not to treat rich people more importantly in their gatherings than they would people who are poor. Just like today, um, many people who have influence and power are also wealthy people. And it can be a huge temptation to us to cater to those kind of people. And I'll confess to you honestly that there have been some times in my ministry um, that, that I've been challenged with this because our church uh, has been challenged with some financial challenges, I'll say. And, uh, and my thought process is we've got to keep this family. We, we've got to keep this family because they're the ones that are really giving to the church. And without them, you know, we won't have a church building and I won't have a salary and all these crazy, terrible things go through my mind. And I just have to be careful because I recognize that as sin because God doesn't see a rich person any more important than he sees a poor person. We're not valued by the amount of money that we can give. We're valued by the a kind of heart of service that we have, right? And so we have to trust in God. But I think they knew that inciting those people would have a great influence in their community. But the word of God, it says in this summary statement spread and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. So um, one of the things that I see here is that, that God's work through Jesus and his plan is fulfilled. This plan is not a new one. It's not something the Jews didn't know. It's not something they weren't waiting for. It was something uh, that's talked about all the way from Genesis, all the way through Revelation. It's a singular story of God's plan to save every human being, to give every human being on earth opportunity. Second Peter says that God doesn't desire that anybody should perish, but everybody should be saved. That's always been his plan. And now we see in Jesus that this is happening. And here specifically, we see how the connection between the law and the prophets that they had studied so much were connected specifically with Jesus. So if you don't have this, write this down. John chapter 5, 39 through 40 is Jesus is speaking to the Jews uh, of his time and the people that are following. He says to them, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that in them you will have eternal life. But these are the scriptures that speak about me. Yet you refuse to come to me and have life. Doesn't that have that connection here with the Jews when he says, um, that Jesus is here to fulfill, to forgive sins, to forgive everything that could not be forgiven by the law. Did you hear that in his speech to them? Jesus is here to forgive sins, to forgive everything that could not be forgiven by the law. And so the law always was meant to point to Jesus. The law, though it was good and it was God's plan, uh, the purpose of the law really was to point out sin. It was to point out the places where we were doing things God didn't want us to do. Certainly, there were aspects of the law that were sacrificial that took care of sin in their eyes. And, but it seems to me that the sacrifices were more meant, again, as real reminders of how often sin took place in their life and to show the true need for something different. So Hebrews will say that Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all for all sins that we didn't have to keep you know having these animal sacrifices it says because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin and so we see this amazing part of who jesus was and how god's plan is fulfilled and so uh, the second thing is when when believers reject god's truth he simply keeps going to those who are willing to hear uh, that should be a warning sign for us shouldn't it I mean, if we're believers, if we get too stubborn and set in our ways and we think it's all about us um, and not about God and, and really doing what God wants, God certainly doesn't just turn us away easily, but eventually God always lets someone go their own way if they don't want to go his way. And so if, for instance, I have been a Christian for almost 50 years, um, I still... Uh, 
claim to you that I trust God with all of my heart. But if I decide that somehow as a pastor, I'm more important than Jesus is, um, you know, and I, and I can get this power mad, crazy sort of attitude. If I just continue down that path, I shouldn't think that God can't take his spirit away from me and begin to go with somebody else. God wants every one of us but just like here with the jews if we refuse him and we begin to oppose him it's not like uh oh the kingdom's gonna fall right god is always seeking out people and there are always people that are seeking him out so i think important messages for us all right let's go to chapter 14 let's read about what happens in iconium at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. Again, there's that statement, go first to the synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and they fled to like Laconian city of Lystra and Derby and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. So again, we see this in sort of condensed form in some ways here in Iconium, where they go to the synagogue Initially, Jews and Gentiles are coming to believe, but there's this, uh, this section of Jews, maybe even that have followed them in some ways that were going after them and inciting people. But whatever the case, there were Jews there that did the same thing that began to oppose them, uh, even to the point that they stirred up people to try to stone Paul and Barnabas when they were there. And so... Um, we know that there are, again, a great number coming, but the people of the city, it says, are really divided. That sort of makes sense for us, doesn't it? <laughs> In our cities, we see people who are greatly divided, those who support the message of Jesus and those who do not, those who uh, believe and follow Jesus and those who oppose uh, Jesus. It's not really anything new. And so it does say that Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there. We don't know exactly how long it was, but uh, again, they're speaking boldly. See that they're speaking boldly for the Lord. In all these instances, they don't shrink back. They don't try to be politically correct. They don't try to keep from offending people. They're just speaking the truth. But, but I believe doing it in love, caring about people, because they knew the message was so important to them, right? It had a saving element to it. So this plot to stone was there, but when they found out, they fled. So a couple of important lessons here in this little short, short section. When, uh, when, when opposition and persecution comes, we shouldn't shrink back. We should continue to speak boldly about what we believe in Jesus. And I want to encourage you to do that, not in a mean and hateful and divisive kind of way, but stand firm in your message. And that's what Paul and Barnabas were doing. Hey, Jesus is a guy. Jesus is the one on the plan. And we're not going to shrink back from proclaiming Jesus as the Christ. So they spoke boldly. And even in the face uh, here where they were receiving this persecution and this plot to kill them, um, they stayed there and they continued to speak. And we're going to see in just a minute how um, they flee in this instance. But in the next instance, that you know something quite different happens to them. And so the second thing I see is that uh, fleeing can be consistent to God's plan for us. Um, I think at times I can believe that God never wants me to run from danger, like when it's in a spiritual sense. Like if I was really in a place where people were opposing me, um, in my mind, at least, I think you should be a martyr for Jesus. You ever think that way? Like you read about people being a martyr for Jesus and think, I want to have the strength at that point to be able to do that. And if I got in that situation, that's what I should do is just stay there and let them kill me for Jesus' sake. And maybe that's true. Maybe that would happen. But 
I think scripture also tells us that fleeing is the right thing to do. Um, Paul and Barnabas and them still had other mission work to do. God was still going to use them. Paul would say later on, for me to die is gain, for, but, but for me to live is Christ. And so they flee here and go on to another place. And so just a reminder that that can also be very much a part of God's plan. Remember that Joseph and Mary fled their hometown and went to Egypt when Herod was killing all the two-year-old babies. God had them flee away from there to protect them. Jesus himself, two or three different times, the crowd gets stirred up and they want to kill him. The Jews, the Pharisees, the teachers of law is trying to kill him. And it says he slipped through the crowd. Well, I don't know what that means, but somehow Jesus knows that fleeing is the right thing to do in that situation. Yet in the garden, he knows it's his time not to flee. So how we discern that, I'm not sure, but I don't, what I'm trying to say is I don't want us to think that getting ourselves out of a dangerous situation is is not the right thing to do because God can continue to use us. And I think we should protect our lives to the point that we can. And I think when God is ready for it not to be protected, it's going to be obvious to us. Okay. All right, let's go on to Lystra and Derby. Starting in verse eight. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bowls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, men, what are you doing? We too are only men, humans like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up, went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. So uh, here's a situation again where they come into the city and they're beginning to speak um, all these things. And, the, and when the crowd hears it, they, they say the statement that gods have come down in human form. Does that ring a bell to you? <laughs> I mean, they're speaking about Jesus, who in fact was God. Who came down in human form but the, but they're thinking paul and uh, barnabas are those people and and what do they do and eventually they absolutely deny it they run out into the crowd and try to keep them from sacrificing you know trying to convince them that this zeus and this hermes that you worship they're they're not living gods like the living god we're trying to call you to worship so again we see immediately when something like that happens, they give credit to God. They give glory to God. They see the miracles and the things that they're doing, and they know that that's not of human origin. And so they think they're gods. Paul and Barnabas quickly give that credit to the living God who has the only power to be able to do those kind of things. So the healless man crippled from birth, again, a very clear and obvious miracle. It was it was obvious to everybody there that something very unusual had happened, that, that he was, after having been crippled in his feet all his life, was able to jump up, stand, and walk. And we see that over and over again about miraculous things. When they all point to God in the midst of them uh, presenting this very new and unusual message to people there, they were confirmed. You hear that often. These things were confirmed by the miracles and the things that were happening. So it wasn't about 
uh, Paul and Barnabas and their great ability and you know, they're miraculous healers. It was about what God was doing and confirming his message through them. And so this does say specifically here that Jews from Antioch and Iconium uh, win the crowd over and they actually stone Paul this time. Paul doesn't escape. He doesn't leave. They stone him, drag him outside the city, believing that he was dead. And it says that the disciples all gather around him. Uh, it doesn't say specifically, but it appears that in the midst of the disciples gathering around him, I don't know if they were praying for him, if um, you know, Barnabas doesn't say they stoned Barnabas, if he was there, they both were doing miracles. If this is a passage where that mentions that Barnabas and Paul are apostles. Uh, we can tend to think of the only apostles being the 12 that were with Jesus. Again, apostle, the term means one specially sent. And so we know that Paul and Barnabas were specially sent by the church in Antioch. And so uh, it seems to me that some miracle had to have taken place because if they, if they had stoned Paul to the extent they actually thought he was dead, he had to be in pretty bad shape, right? And so they, uh, they may have assumed he did, whether or they did or not, certainly the difference between him being dragged out of the city and then suddenly standing up and what happens? Right, right, right back in the city, right? Imagine what people thought when they saw him walking back into the city. Um, I try to think of myself being there and I think, man, how, what an encouragement that would be to me. Like Paul's, he just got stoned, they thought to death, and now he's, he's going right back into the fray, right? What, uh, what a courage of spirit that he had um, to be able to do that. And so, a um, couple of important lessons here is um, Jesus is the only God who came down in human form. Right? He didn't come to be served, though. He, he came to serve others and to give his life as a ransom. And so they see Paul think he's come down in human form. He says he's not. And then they try to take Paul's life. But it wasn't as a ransom for anybody. Right. This is all just human stuff going on. And that all humans um, are only doing God's good work, they were still only humans. No matter what good work we do for God, we're still just humans, right? Um, we don't lift each other up on pedestals. We don't worship anybody but Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. They're the only ones deserving. We don't worship our pastors. We don't worship our husbands or our wives. We don't lift anybody up on a pedestal where they don't belong. We are all on equal ground together as human beings, gifted by God through the Holy Spirit to do different works, but it is the same God that works in all of us. And so I just love how Luke reminds us through the Spirit um, how important it is to see each other that way uh, as, as fellow human beings doing the work of God, even when powerful things are happening. All right, so let's read the last section. They preached the good news in that city, which is Derby, and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and then they had preached the word. Uh, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attila. From Attila, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they were now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So now we see them. Uh, sort of backtracking through all the cities where they had been. Again, uh, you see the power of the Spirit encouraging them to go places, even where there was great opposition. They're just not afraid to go right back in uh, and check up. But uh, I love what it says. They, they go for this purpose, to strengthen the disciples and encourage them to remain true to the faith. And what an encouragement to see Paul and Barnabas, even in the midst of opposition and stoning, they're still staying true to the faith. They're still staying in there, preaching the same message, following the same Jesus. And their message to them isn't, 
wow, this is good. God's going to, you know, give you everything that you want, everything you need. It's going to be a great life with great joy. And uh, certainly there's some of that, but the message to them is we have to go through great hardships uh, in order to continue uh, and enter into the kingdom of God. So uh, Jesus tells us that if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Uh, if you're a person of faith, you're going to face persecution. You're going to face hardships because of your faith. It is a reality. And so it's not, uh, it's not God ordaining that for you. It's God preparing you for the reality of a world that opposes him. If they oppose him, they're going to oppose those who follow. So it says they appointed elders in each church. And again, I think the indication is they appointed elders in the church at Iconium. They appointed elders at the church at Lystra. Um, it was a citywide understanding. In the Jewish community, if you remember back in the Old Testament, uh, the elders used to sit at the city gates. And if there were decisions that had to be made or they sat almost like judges helping people make decisions, the elders went to the city gate, a prominent place, and people would come to them and ask for wisdom from God, decisions from God. So I think that same sort of idea that elders were appointed people, spiritually mature people were appointed to help strengthen, encourage, teach the church in every city. So they sail back to Antioch and Syria now because the work they had been sent to do was completed. They reported how God had opened the door to the Gentiles, that in fact, the word of God was now helping Gentiles come to, into the saving life of Jesus. And it says they stayed there for a long time with the disciples. So at this point, at the end, um, I think it's important for us to see, I, I don't know how you perceive the, what is important for churches when we meet together, whether it's Sunday or Wednesday, life groups, whatever it is. When we gather, one of the most important things that we're to do is to strengthen and encourage one another. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 14 talks about the same thing, that we build one another up. We were meant to encourage one another. Hebrews chapter 10 says we shouldn't stop meeting together, but instead we should come and encourage one another even more as we see the day coming. So I hope that you're doing that. I hope that you're feeling that in, in the midst of gathering together. Um, we can worship God on our own in any place in a quiet room by ourselves. Yes, I agree. Um, and yet there's something so important to being among the body of believers. And yes, we, we worship, we praise, we pray, uh, we may take communion, we, we do all these things. But one of the things that I really love, and I think this is why God brings us together as community, is the strength and encouragement I get from being among people who are like-minded on Sunday morning. Because too often, you guys know more than me, I'm a pastor, I'm not among a lot of people that are not believers, but some. Uh, but you guys, especially as you go out, you're among people that are maybe not so encouraging. Uh, don't necessarily, you know, lift you up, give you strength. And I hope you're getting that from the church. And, and I hope you're being that to the church because it's sort of central to what we're going to do because we do have to go through hardships uh, in order to remain faithful. Even Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 9 that he beats his body daily so that he doesn't lose the prize to which he's telling everybody to maintain, to attain to. So uh, it's not that it's a hard, impossible thing and not many find it. It's that it takes effort. Faith takes effort <laughs> for us, right? To remain faithful takes some effort. And that's why I appreciate you guys being here because I think us studying together is a way for us to, to help maintain our faith. So I and here again, we see the, this important work of praying and fasting together, just such an invaluable time connecting to God and allowing our time to uh, be focused on him. Fasting in particular is a time that's meant to deny our physical body something so that we can concentrate on something spiritual. So it really opens us up uh, to, to connect with God and not just to feed this physical body. So I hope that you practice that. Um, I'll tell you, it's not something that I do um, like weekly or something, but I do fast from time to time. And uh, those times are both challenging and rewarding to me. Because I got to tell you, I'm a lover of food. <laughs> God 
has too much good stuff to eat on this planet. I'm telling you, too many fast food restaurants on my way home. But anyway, uh, fasting is is just so good and connecting with God. So I hope that you are able to practice that from time to time. And if you don't, I, I, I want to encourage you to try. It doesn't have to be 40 days and 40 nights like Jesus. It can be a meal. Uh, it can be a day. It, you know, it can be uh, a couple of days, three days, whatever you want to try. But I would encourage you to try it. All right. Well, that's all I have for you guys. Ace, good to see you. I didn't say hello. Good morning. Hi, Pastor Mark. Uh, just, uh, you know, I wanted to mention I, I love food, too, so I want to give you a fist bump. <laughs> All right. Back at you. And uh, uh, one thing, uh, when they brought the bulls and flowers to Paul and Barnabas, it made me think that maybe back in two chapters back when Herod uh, was receiving praise, that maybe they offered similar gestures to him, too. Could be. Uh, Could very well be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he certainly, and he certainly didn't deny it, did he? He, he was soaking all that in, and it cost him his life. Right. Yeah. All right, you guys, have a good night. Good to see you. Good to have you with us. Have a blessed week. We'll see you next week, if not before, and we're in the grocery right. store, the fast food restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.